Welcome everyone, it is so fantastic to see you here today in person and on Zoom. So this is our third online and in-person event, so um, we should be practised by now, but if anything does go really wrong, then please do just bear with us. Um, it's just really, really fantastic to see so many people here today, so many familiar faces, so many new ones. It's just so exciting to be back in person. Um, if you don't know, my name is Becky and... Um, I'm the events curator this evening, so if you have any questions afterwards, want to give us any feedback about how tonight has run, then please do just let us know. We want to improve how we do events online and in person, so if there is anything you think that could be better or works really well, do just let us know, because this is a whole big learning process for us, so we'd really appreciate it. Um, we're hosting this talk to raise money for this fantastic place that is St Bride and just by being here you're helping keeping it run running for like future generations to enjoy and of course please do come and use the library as well we are still open we're open by appointment only one day a week and you can find all about that on our website so do come and use us if you would like to um, as I'm sure most of you here know it's just a fantastic collection and this is why we do these events to help keep it going so as we are live streaming this event, please bear with us if we have any technical difficulties. If this does happen, we will try to rectify this as soon as possible. For anyone who is on Zoom, if you're experiencing technical difficulties your end, please do just log in and back out again. That normally sort of sorts it out, or restarting your computer sometimes helps as well. But if you are having more difficulties, please don't worry. We are recording this lecture, so you'll be able to to watch it after the event if there are problems. And we will be sending everyone who attended the lecture in person the recording as well, so you'll be able to watch it again. Um, okay, so can I just say to everyone on Zoom, please can you just make sure that you're all muted, just in case it interrupts any of the proceedings? It shouldn't do, but we just like to make sure that everyone is. And if you're in person, please can you just make sure that your mobile phones are turned on silent. We're happy for you to take photographs throughout this evening, but just make sure there's no flash or anything like that so that it doesn't disturb anyone. Um, okay, next thing. So for anyone attending in person, um, we'd just like to make you aware that if there is a fire, you will hear one continuous alarm bell. And the meeting place, if that happens, is through reception, through the archway in the courtyard, and into Salisbury Square, where there's a big monument, and that's the meeting place for the fire, if that happens. If that way is blocked and the fire is there, all you have to do is make your way down, left out of this door or that door, down the staircase past the theatre bar, and out through the doors that way, and then the meeting place will be just, you know, will guide you around up to the other meeting place. But hopefully it won't happen, but if you are, hopefully you're vaguely prepared. Um, okay, so this lecture is part of our celebrating 125 years of the St Bride Library and it has been kindly sponsored by Adobe, Commercial Type, iMagazine, Eric de Belague, Google, Jerry Wright, Just Another Foundry, Klim Type Foundry, Lex and GB Creative and Innovative Print, The Mayor of London, Mediator Graphics and Animation, Peter Longland, Trevor Fenwick, our typography, typed by Usborne Publishing and the Wink into Word Society Charitable Trust. Um, they have been so generous throughout our crowdfunding campaign and this year we'd just like to say an extra big thank you as this is the last event that they'll be sponsoring. They really have been absolutely fantastic and we really couldn't have done a lot of things this year without them, so they've been extra brilliant. Um, and just to let you know that our final event of 2021 is going to be the next iMagazine Type Tuesday. And this will be a Christmas special. Details will be announced shortly, but it's actually going to be on a Thursday for this year because there was a problem with the date. So it is going to be an unofficial Type Thursday, and it's on the 9th of December. So do look out for details online when that comes up. I know it's going to be an absolute cracker, so do, we do hope that you can come and join us for that one as well. As you are aware, tonight marks a very special occasion. This is the 50th anniversary of the Beatrice Ward Memorial Lecture. We are very ha happy to welcome her niece, Brenda, who is joining us online from, via Zoom from New York this evening. So a very special welcome to her. For those who don't know, Beatrice Ward was an American writer on typography who settled here in the UK in the 1920s. She was a champion of fine printing and typography, firstly in her role as editor of the Monotype Recorder and subsequently as marketing manager for the Monotype Corporation, a role she fulfilled for over 30 years. She saw education as being vital. As an astute businesswoman, she recognised that the education of students was a means of ensuring a future Monotype customer base. But more generally, she recognised education as a mechanism for securing the future of sound principles in printing and typographic knowledge. 
She died in 1969, and such was her contribution to the art of typography that a recommendation was made to establish a permanent memorial in her name. Here, I am grateful to Jessica Glazer at the University of Birmingham, who located some of the paperwork relating to the setting up of the memorial. I quote, in view of her many successes on the lecture platform, we think it appropriate to suggest the foundation of, of an annual Beatrice Ward Memorial Lecture. Ward's enthusiastic support in helping preserve the typographic library here at St. Bride determined that the memorial lecture should be overseen by St. Bride and held here. The intent was, and again I quote, to invite each year an authority of international standing to illuminate some aspect in the field of communications, particularly with regard to printing and typography. As such, it is an enormous pleasure to welcome this year's speakers, David Williams, Ellen Lupton, Eric Van Blockland, Liron Lavid Torkinich, Martina Floor, Paul Barnes, and Trey Seals. David, Liron, and Paul will be joining us in person, and the rest will be presenting their talks via pre recorded videos. Tonight's event will last up to 90 minutes without a break. It is unlikely that we will have time for a live Q&A in the hall as we have so many fantastic talks coming up, but our overseas speakers will be joining us on Zoom, so if anyone there online has any questions for them, do pop them in the chat with their name at the beginning and they will answer as many as they can going on tonight. And I would finally like to say a huge thank you to David Pearson for designing the logo that celebrates tonight's evening. He did it, you know, all from the goodness of his heart and created it, which we've got these lovely pin badges made from as well. So a huge thank you to David for that. And I think we have got a couple of... Oh, yeah, huge clap to David. Thank you. So I know everyone here has been given one as part of their ticket, so I know there's a few people online who would love to buy one, and we will have a few um, limited numbers available online on our shop in the next couple of days. So if you do would like to get your hands on one, do keep an eye out on our social media, and we'll let you know how you can get your hands on one. They are limited to 100, so they're very special things, and we absolutely love them. So without further ado, that is um, my little introduction over. And I am now delighted to be handing over to Paul Barnes to kick off the proceedings this evening. If I can just get his talk up. So, thank you very much for listening. And now over to Paul Barnes. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Um, it's a tremendous honour to be here uh, doing the Beatrice Ward Memorial Lecture. This is the second time I've done it, so I see quite familiar now with Beatrice and uh, her work, which, you, as you probably all know, is written down in the Crystal Goblet. When I saw this quote about good and bad types, the first thing I did was go and read the essay. And the essay, as you've all got in front of you, is actually called about choosing typefaces, but it's mainly dedicated to kind of book typefaces. Um, Beatrice is quite generous in that she doesn't really shame any typefaces and name them. I mean, you can, if you read it, actually find that she says that there's a certain typeface that you shouldn't use because it has an ugly G and it has a non-kerning F. Um, I've identified that as Cheltenham, but she doesn't mention it by name. She's slightly not that positive about Centaur um, below 24 point, but apart from that, she's pretty positive about things. One thing I'd like to get over uh, is that I don't actually believe in this kind of notion of good and bad typefaces. Um, this is a good typeface. This is a typeface by one of my colleagues at Commercial Type, Tim Ripper. It's called Seance, and this is a good typeface. I think the thing I would like to point out is rather that this is a suitable typeface or this is an unsuitable typeface. So I was delighted to find out that this typeface has been bought by someone in Los Angeles who's been putting it on, I think, some kind of hip-hop merchandise, which I think is it's entirely appropriate for. I would kind of have a problem if this was uh, used as a book text typeface. So that's my kind of take on good and bad type. Anyway, what I found really interesting about Beatrice Ward's uh, essay is the kind of notion of choice and what choice means. When she sh in the book, it actually shows you these are kind of some suggestions of typefaces. As you may have gathered, they're all from the Monotype Corporation, whereas we found out she was the publicity officer. Officer. She puts kind of some vague comments about some of them, like, for example, that Caslon has quite heavy caps, Plantin is good for coated paper, Baskerville is perhaps not as economical as Fournier. But what interested me was the kind of notion of what choice could be at that time. She talks about a book printer perhaps having four text typefaces that you could choose from. 
and it would be rather impertinent if you were to ask for another one. One of the reasons probably is the economic cost of buying typefaces. Today in our digital world where typefaces can be free, uh, they're phenomenally cheap compared to what they used to be in the physical world. What I'd like to kind of consider is how choice has changed over time from the days of metal into kind of the days of photo typesetting, things like rub down lettering, then into the digital era and to where we are now and what's the place we find ourselves in. So I kind of wanted to look at the kind of time where Beatrice wrote this essay. I think the essay is around 1955. So this is a kind of typical British printer, one of the more famed ones, Westrum, just down in Kent, um, run by the Atterbury's. These are two specimens from 1951 and 1958. The one on the right is approximately 16 pages. And what I think is interesting about that is, in choice, you can literally hold your choice in your hands and see what it is. And what it equates to is nine different monotype composition faces in a variety of sizes, things like Baskerville, Bulmer, Erhardt, Fournier, Joanna, Times, and Van Dyck. So that's quite a limited choice. Um, and I think there's kind of you know, pros and cons to that. But literally, as a designer, you choose a typeface, and that's, that's the moment. The design is everything that comes after that. But obviously, in the kind of days of metal, choosing the wrong, say, text typeface would have a disastrous uh, consequences. You know, it would be very uneconomical to have to reset an entire book if you had, say, three pages of runover. In terms of display, they only had 32 display faces, 30 in foundry type and two in photo lettering. So that's a remarkably small selection compared to what you, most of you probably have on your desktop computers today. But I think, you know, this is, there's a lot to be said for it. But I'd like to go back further. So let's go back to, say, the 18th century and what is choice then? Choice is what your book printer has. Well, the book printer is the one who's going to choose it. The choice the book printer is, is which foundry do we go to? So if you're in Scotland, you'd go to Alexander Wilson and Son, Glasgow. This is 1783. Basically, what we see on this page is one, two, three, four different styles of typeface. We see a transitional Roman, we see a black letter, we see Hebrew, and we see Greek. That's your entire choice. And you would think, well, other, spe other printers and, uh, would have different types because they'd have a different foundry they went to. So if we go to London and we look at Joseph Fry and we look at their types, they're virtually identical. There is no choice. The choices you're making are things like size. That's about it. You know, so that's what it was like in the 18th century. So if we imagine then going into the 19th century, well, the 19th century, of course, as we know, is the kind of birth of display type, where type starts to, you know, advertising, where type has to kind of fight for people's interests. That means there's going to be thousands and thousands of new typefaces in those found specimens. But if we look at a type specimen from the 19th century, this is around 1860. This is one of the largest printers in London, Spotterswood, who would have been doing kind of poster printing, jobbing printing, book printing. They do indeed have a large selection of typefaces in this 100-page specimen, 283 faces in 41 styles. And I think for most of us, we can still comprehend that number. You know, and this is what display types are. There's lots of different ones. But most of the time, you know, you're looking at, say, two pica, three pica, and then you have a choice of maybe five or six different display faces. The choice is kind of limited. And if it comes to kind of book work and serif work, well, you've got a choice between on the left, you have the modern faces that Spotterswood had, and on the right, you have old faces. This is after the kind of revival of Caslon. So these are the Caslon faces and then also the revival of faces from the Figgins foundry. So that's what choice is like. So let's go forward. Let's forget about photo setting and things like that and go into the kind of the digital, digital age straight away. I picked this bit because this is when I started as a student. This is my first ever type specimen. It's uh, for a linotype collection for a linotronic typesetting system, which is what we have at University of Reading. So how big is selection now? Well, this is the entire range. There's 431 families, 1,820 different styles. That's quite a lot. And actually now, when you look at this number, choosing a typeface, it's a bit of a harder task. Well, it is and it isn't. The fact is the University of Reading typesetting department probably had about 20 typefaces. So Galliard, Bembo, Frudica, Trump Medieval, etc., etc. Choice is still relatively limited. 
You know, 1988, when I started, of course, is the beginning of this place, the democratization of type, the kind of age that we live in now. Before this point, literally with every new technology, thousands of typefaces from the old technology would disappear from use. So if you like, the pile of typefaces was being edited. So there was never that m thousands and thousands of choices of typefaces from the beginning of Gutenberg. But at this point of democratization of type, where the first time users really were fully in charge of setting. So, you know, on your home computer, you could buy the typeface, you could set the typeface. You had all those kind of things, which is kind of great, but also kind of limiting in other ways. You now have to pay for the type. No longer can you charge out to a client the cost of setting a book. In the old days, we used to send clients bills for typesetting. No more. We have to do it. And, you know, it started off very, very slowly. So this is one of the first Adobe type specimens from 1991. There's 131 families, there's 576 styles. Of this, probably 125 were old typefaces. They were typefaces they'd si simply taken from the Linotype library. A few of them, they'd started a new system, the Adobe Originals, and this is another reason why this is democratization of type people could start to de design typeface who weren't large corporations. So Adobe, yes, they were a large corporation, they were doing it. But you and I could do it. We could get a piece of software, photographer, and we could start designing a typeface. So the choice is starting to get, get bigger and bigger. So jump forward to 2006. This is the last font shop font book. I haven't counted how many pages it is. It's probably about 800. If you dropped it from a height on someone's head, you'd probably kill them. There's over 7,872 styles of typeface. I don't know how many families that is. Probably one, two, three, four thousand, you know, families. It's really hard. Obviously, at this time, a lot of the type now is going online, and that's where you buy it, and that's where we find ourselves today. And what a great place it is, because if you've got the Creative Cloud, you might have unlimited access to more than 20,000 fonts today. 20,000 fonts. Or you might go to my fonts and decide I want to buy a font. It's fantastic. Over 130,000 available fonts and counting. Now, if you go and type in the word geometric sans, which I think in the days of the Linotronic, you probably have maybe 10, 15 choices. You've now got 7,000 results. And from 7,000 results, if you press the button which says sans serif, you've got 4,000 results. So basically, it's a bit like this. It's like supermarket. And things are cheap, and there's lots of it, but sometimes you can get lost in it. And this is, I guess, where I find myself, and me and others. We're independent type foundries. We're like a kind of little delicatessen. Well, that's how we started off. This was the kind of slide we showed back in 2010. And then it was really simple. We had nine families, 312 styles. Literally on that page, you can see what, what we had. Of course, the reality is now, We've started to turn into a bit of a mini supermarket. We've got 42 families, 1,685 styles. It's incredible. You know, and this is where I want to kind of end my talk with this kind of graph, which is a completely made up. It's something that Tufty would get really annoyed about because there's no kind of guide of numbers and things like that. The main thing you want to see is, is that by the 2000s, the number of users of type is increasing massively. The number of typefaces is increasing massively. The style of typefaces is increasing, but not at the same rate. The number of foundries and designers is increasing. The cost of typefaces is coming down. In fact, often now free. You can't imagine Linotype in 1988 saying, here's a free typeface. But they are free now. So I kind of want to leave you with this kind of quick thought. Is this, do we find ourselves in a great place, or do we find ourselves in a le less great place? I think we are kind of in an incredible place, but there's some kind of issues with it. Maybe we've got too much choice. I don't know. It's up for you to decide. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Paul. That was just a fantastic place to start tonight's proceedings. Um, I know we've got so many diverse thoughts on the, fr on the theme of tonight, which is good types and bad types. So our next speaker is uh, Martina Floor, who, is, um, who has pre-recorded a video for us. 
So Martina is on Zoom, I believe. So um, hi, Martina from London. It's really great. And thank you so much for um, pre-recording your video for us. So let me press play. And start. Well, hello, everybody. My name is Martina Fur. I'm a lettering artist, author, educator, and I'm based in Berlin. I run my own lettering and custom typography studio. Um, and I'm really excited to be part of this year's memorial lecture for Betty's uh, Ward. Um, when I was invited uh, to this lecture, I was already very inspired by the um, topic of this year's lecture, which is bad type, good types. I think it's always a good idea for us to think about what is, what are our standards? What are, what is our purpose as designers and makers? And I think if there's something that I admire about, about Beatriz is that she was, she was questioning old standards and she was preaching for new standards in our discipline. And I think that what is inspiring about her is how her work had a purpose and how she was pursuing that purpose through preaching for good typography and also working in the field and doing great work. Um, and this resonates a lot with me because I think that establishing standards is really important and it's something I've been thinking about in the last few years and this is how I came to write um, my Ten Commandments of lettering. Um, you know, as you know, I'm, I'm specialized in lettering and I've been doing lettering for the past 10, 11 years. And throughout my experience as a commercial lettering artist, I have written down some uh, commandments of lettering. These are actually values and principles um, that I like to um, you know, that I like to have present in my work. And this is how I came to write these commandments. And in the past year, I turned them into a training for my students so that um, they could kind of understand how these values could look like and also learn um, how this can have an impact in their work. So I want to present this training to you. And I think this, um, this St. Bright's Library is a perfect location for for watching this training because it is you know this training is kind of has a kind of like a harry potter sort of mood so i think this location is like a privileged location to watch this specific training so without further ado i hope you enjoy the training and thank you so much again for having me welcome my name is Martina Flor, I'm a lettering artist and educator, and I'm extremely excited to have you in this training. Before we get started, I want to tell you a little bit about me. I've been learning, doing, and teaching lettering for the past 12 years. You might also know me as the author of the book, The Golden Secrets of Lettering, which was printed in six languages and sold over 50,000 copies worldwide. With this book, I got to positively influence the life and work of many lettering artists and creatives. You may be one of them. So much so that they call it the Bible of lettering. This makes me extremely proud, but also entitled enough to create the 10 commandments of lettering. And so this is what this training is about. 10 principles that will guide your way as a lettering artist to create great lettering. I'm sure that you're here because you're all for it, right? Great, throughout the next few lessons, I will break down the commandments and open your eyes to the world of drawing letters. After this training, you will know exactly what to do to take your lettering to the next level. So, are you ready? Are you? Because I am. Let's do this. Number one, you should have a message to convey. Lettering is primarily a communication tool. What makes lettering such a fascinating discipline is how content, so the text you're drawing, and its shape, the actual form of these words, are counterparts for the same message. So it is not about illustrating a text in any random way, but it's about being intentional with what you want to say and in which way you want to say it. So for instance, I could say love in a very bubbly way, like, ah, I love you so much. Or I could say love in a more delicate way. I love you. Can you see that? 
The shape of the letters can even sometimes contradict the actual text, so I can say a really bad word in an elegant way, like That is the power of lettering, to communicate much more than the literal meaning of the words. So remember, you should have a story to tell beyond the actual text that you're drawing. Number two, you shall prioritize readability. We have learned that in lettering, the message is important. So it's equally important that we are able to read that message. If there's something that sets lettering apart from other artistic disciplines using letters like street art, is that the message is the actual heart of the piece. We start with the letters and because of them, and we build around them, not the other way around. And so effects, illustrations, decorative elements and flourishes, you know I love all of this, but they should always be put in service of the words and the story you're trying to convey and never get in the way of readability. So when it comes to adding decoration and effects, I have a personal rule, which is bring them in, but don't let them mess around. Number three, you shall not letter statements you don't agree with. When you letter in a statement, you're putting your craft and skills in service of promoting that message and giving it a voice. Especially if you're working as a professional lettering artist, you will often be illustrating texts and words that are given to you. And so before committing to it, make sure you double check whether it might have political and religious connotations that may not align with your values and beliefs. Let your art better support messages you believe in and agree with. I have a personal story around this. I was once commissioned to create a series of lettering pieces for a coloring book for teenagers. After the contract was signed, I was getting ready you know, to work and I started going through the text I had to illustrate and among them, well, there were some statements that I didn't personally agree with. They were not aggressive or offensive, but I thought that they picture a vision of what a girl should be that to me was old and outdated. This experience taught me that as a learning artist, you should always read the text before committing to the assignment and signing a contract. Your art is just too valuable to contribute to causes you don't align with. Number four, you shall not use the term lettering in reference to calligraphy. With the rise of lettering as an artistic discipline, there has been some confusion around what lettering is and what's not, which is totally normal. Let's throw some light on it. As a definition, lettering is about drawing words, while calligraphy is about writing words, right? And I know what you would say, that there's a lot of calligraphy out there under the category of lettering, especially when it comes to brush calligraphy, but this is still calligraphy. Most likely, if it's done with a calligraphic tool, you're looking at calligraphy. If it's drawn, so for instance, done with the pencil, then you're most likely looking at lettering. They're both beautiful disciplines and they influence each other greatly. Well, to be honest, Lettering owes a lot to calligraphy, and this is why we have an entire commandment reserved for it. Number five, you shall acknowledge the role of calligraphy in the shape of your letters. Calligraphy is the mother of all letter shapes. In the past, it was a very important reproduction tool. In medieval times, books were written by hand and therefore very scarce and expensive. Luckily, things have evolved and we live in a world where books are commodities and accessible to all of us, so alleluia. However, the impact of calligraphy on letter forms is still apparent in the structure and shape of our letters today. You can see it in lettering pieces that pick up inspiration from past historical eras like this one inspired by medieval books. But even on more modern lettering pieces, you will see a strong imprint of a calligraphic tool. Now, I don't think that you need to be an expert calligrapher to rock it at lettering, but studying calligraphy and understanding how tools work will help you understand the shape of our alphabet and find solutions to your own designs. As I always say, a smart lettering artist always has a set of calligraphic tools at hand. Number six, you should give consistency to your letter shapes. Consistency is everything, remember that. But first, what is consistency? 
Cambridge Dictionary defines consistency as the quality of always behaving or performing in a similar way or of always happening in a similar way. In letter design, this translates into creating letter forms with shared features. This means that in order to make a set of letters or words look like they belong together or they belong to the same family, they need to have some common aspects. The contrast, for instance, which is the difference between the thickest and the thinnest part of your letter should be consistent. The spacing, that is the space between the letters, should be consistent as well. And that applies to all aspects of your letter forms. The weight, the X height, the style, the calligraphic origin, the rhythm. Finding the patterns that make your letters belong together is paramount in lettering design. Number seven, you shall consider negative space. We have been talking quite a lot about letter forms, but they are not the only important aspect of letter making. Like with the yin yang, you can identify substance thanks to the lack of substance. And in lettering, letter forms exist with and because of the white space around them. So the space around the letter is also something you to take into account when drawing letter forms. The space inside the letter influences the space outside the letter and vice versa. A word that is a space too tight looks overall heavier than a word that is spaced too loosely. Therefore, the space has an impact on the perception of your letters and should be taken into consideration at all times. Even when designing black and white, the inversion of colors can cause the letters to look very different. Look at this lettering piece on black background and the same in black on white background. Letter forms on the white background look thinner and overall less consistent just because of how the negative space is perceived. Number eight, you shall not fear ornaments and flourishes. Oh, you know me, I go crazy when it comes to decorative elements and flourishes. And I love them for a couple of reasons. One of them because they can really complement your lettering and even help you solve balance and composition issues. So for instance, in a lettering piece with a strong capital letter that is causing a disbalance, flourishing can help you balance that out. It can even sustain your lettering piece and create a frame around it that reinforces the meaning. The other thing that I love about decorative elements and flourishing is that they can create a sense of wonder that makes a mark on the reader's eye. When used wisely, decorative elements can be a great addition to your piece. Don't be afraid of them. Instead, make them your friends. Number nine, you shall care for detail. Details are not just details. They just make the whole difference. Always go that extra mile for that detail that other non-trained eyes might not notice. Soften that curve, move that anchor point one millimeter to the left, make the optical adjustment in the crossing stroke of that letter. If you can see it and you know how to improve it, go for it. That often makes the difference between good and amazing. Number 10, you shall create something unique. And I know what you're thinking here. Oh yeah, as if it's that easy to create something unique. And on top of that, there's so many other artists out there doing great work that it feels almost unattainable to be able to create work that stands out. I get it, but I want to tell you that it's possible for you to create work that is unique and it stands out in the crowd. For this, you will need to acquire tools that allow you to understand what you're doing so that you don't need to check on someone else's work or scroll through your social media feed to find solutions for your own work because this is when your work starts looking like someone else's work and you certainly don't want that. I know because I was there too and it wasn't until I quit this pattern that I started taking off with my work. Instead of investing my energy there, I dedicated myself to learning the foundations of letter design and acquiring efficient techniques and seeking guidance from mentors and feedback from creative communities. I believe that this is what allowed me to focus on my own game and develop skills to finally get to the point where I was creating work that no one else was creating, work that I was really proud of. I know how much of a game changer this can be, and this is why every year I take a limited number of students into my lettering seminar program. This eight-week seminar is the closest thing to a full-blown university education on hand lettering. 
So join me as I help you unlock your full potential as an artist and gain a deeper understanding of the fascinating world of letters while producing work that stands out and designing the kind of pieces you know you could do. Sign up for the waiting list and get priority access to the program. We are opening our doors very soon. See you there. Now that you know what the Ten Commandments of Lettering are all about, it's time to take a vow of loyalty to them. Below you will find wallpapers and printables to always keep these commandments near you, as well as stories for you to share your vows with the world. You're now one of us, and with great power comes great responsibility. Use it wisely. That was quite good, right? How do you think I was? Yeah? Huge thanks to uh, Martina. Um, if you could all give her a round of applause so she can hear it, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Um, sorry, please bear with me while I transition between videos. So thank you so much to Martina. I believe she is on Zoom, so if anyone does have a question online for her, then please do ask them in the chat. Um, next up is another video from Trey Seals, who is part of um, Set Up Vocal Type, and he's Washington-based over in the US, and I believe he's also joining us on Zoom. So if you are here, hi Trey from London as well. It's really great to have you joining us virtually, which is what I love about doing online and live streaming events. It's just fantastic and opening the world up. So here we go. When, when I was first given the theme for the series, I wondered whether or not Beatrice and I would get along. And I mean, no offense to her or her legacy. It's just that my understanding of good types and bad types has little to do with whether or not a character stands out amongst the rest. My understanding of good types and bad types has to do with my personal experience. So before I dive in, please allow me to reintroduce myself. My name is Trey Seals, and I am the founder of Vocal Type Co. For those who aren't familiar with my work, Vocal Type is a diversity-driven font foundry inspired by the histories and progressive movements of underrepresented cultures. These sources of inspiration most commonly lead to the creation of fonts inspired by protest graphics in all of their various forms, whether they be protest signs from the civil rights movement to giant banners from the women's suffrage movement in all of its various countries, to architectural signage from the LGBTQ rights movement, and so much more, which I will dive into a little soon. As someone who primarily designs display types, I find that my understanding of good types and bad types extends beyond type itself and into areas of culture and society, and more generally, morals and ethics. For example, I recently wrote this article for the brand identity about stereotypography, which I believe is the worst of bad types. If you're a graphic designer, stereotypography is the practice of using stereotypes to inform your font and lettering choices. If you're a type designer, this is the practice of designing fonts based on the culture's stereotypes. For example, the most common form of stereotypography, in my opinion, is the Latinization of foreign scripts, such as Arabic, Greek, Devangari, Hebrew, Cyrillic, and the list goes on. One of the most offensive examples of this, I find, is the font known as wonton, along with its dozen or more derogatory variants. Wonton was supposedly a style, stylized to mimic the brushstrokes of Chinese characters, 
but put to use, this font has reinforced false narratives of East Asian culture since the 1880s. They can most commonly be seen in the form of restaurant signs, menus, karate studios, and movie posters. But beyond the promotion of stereotypes, these types have also been used by corporations and politicians since the 1880s and as recent as 2018 to promote xenophobia. For the sake of time, in short, stereotypography is harmful and degrading, which is why I consider it to be the worst of the bad types. However, I'd like to share this idea with you all of how we can turn these, this wide variety <laughs> of bad types into, well, good types. In 1933, the American type founders recasted a font created in the 1850s known as Gothic Shade. While the type was the same, they decided to make a name change. Gothic Shade became Jim Crow. For those who aren't aware, Jim Crow is a lot of different things. In the beginning, Jim Crow was a stage character portrayed in what we now call blackface that toured throughout America and England all throughout the 1800s. But then in the 1900s, there were Jim Crow laws, which reinforced the concept of segregation or what they call separate but equal. With all of this in mind, while I began the process of reviving this typeface, it was important to give it a new name, in my opinion, that empowered those that were previously harmed by the name Jim Crow. This is where the name VTC Ruby comes in. Named after activist Ruby Bridges, she was one of the first children of color to integrate into an all white school at only six years old. Become basically becoming the catalyst for what was the end of Jim Crow laws. And with this in mind, I've been working to find out how can we take other bad types and turn them into symbols of power for those that these bad types have harmed in the past. Because the only way to invalidate stereotypography is by conducting meaningful research that honors and respects marginalized cultures, just as, well, good types should. And I think Beatrice would agree. Thank you. Thank you so much to Trey. I'm not sure if he's joining us on Zoom, but if he is, um, hello. So, sorry, I keep saying that. Um, it's just really lovely to have people joining us from across the um, globe. So now we have another in-person speaker, and I am delighted that um, Liron Lavi Torkanic has joined us all the way from Israel and flown over for the occasion, which is absolutely fantastic. So um, welcome to Liron. Thank you. Ooh. Hey everyone, can you hear me? Yeah. It's so lovely to be here and I am just so delighted for the opportunity to actually do a face-to-face -face talk. So, so nice to see reactions and really thank you for the invitation. So, just like uh, the other speakers, I received this quote by Beatrice Ward uh, as a beginning, as a brief. And it's so incredible to see how each, each and every one of us takes it to a whole different area. And I'm going to take you to a journey, <laughs> to a Hebrew journey. So the quote, as we all saw this evening, there are bad types and good types, and the whole science and art of typography begins after the first category has been set aside. But <laughs> it's complicated. So when I was trying to look at some of the Hebrew type from around the history and thinking what my opinion was on them, 
I discovered very early on that it's not as, it's not as such a dichotomy. It's not very easy to, to decide if some type is bad or good. These things can change because of our perspective, because of the period in time, and with much, many more factors that actually define what we think about this type or if it's actually good or bad. So we all have opinions, and opinions tend to be very strong. If we can base them on facts, it's even better. What I've discovered is that there are a lot more opinions than facts when digging, in, digging into these Hebrew stories. So as the Greek philosopher Heraclitus said, uh, you cannot step in the same river twice, for other waters are continually flowing on. And this is actually to say that if we were being here in a different time, a different year, looking with different eyes at these very stories, they would be different, and our opinions could have been different, and I'm sure they were. So I was trying to use the Hebrew as a case study to give basic principles on which factors we actually need to consider when we're looking at a piece of type and thinking if it's good or bad. So the factors we're going to go through are the period, so the time in which this type is presented, the legibility, so if we can identify the letters, if they're readable at all, uh, the expertise of the person who is designing them, as well as the expertise of the person who is viewing them. If they are professional designers, if they are uh, amateur type designers, what's the context, what is the platform that we're looking at the type in? And also, we must not forget the form. How does the form actually look? And the last bit is the knowledge. So at the beginning, I was trying to think of, uh, is someone a native speaker or not a native speaker? And I decided that this is not really the discussion. Our discussion should be if the person is knowledgeable in the script they're designing for. So this is a, our base slide, base point. This is how Hebrew looks. So just so we're all on the same page. And we're going to look at a few stories. So the first one is Kaplan's reform. Uh, and we're going to look at the type, if it's good or bad, through the period in which it was uh, published. So Joseph Kaplan, uh, he was from Zurich, and he came up with a solution to the Hebrew, which he found very problematic. So Joseph Kaplan added many characters, and he also decided that the Hebrew should always be monolinear to improve readability. And also, I forgot to mention, I'm going to take the, as much as I can the reporter's role here and try not to base my personal opinions. As I said, they're very strong. So he decided to also add characters. And since we're looking at the period, it's important to say that at the time of 1914, the Hebrew was beginning to be revived as a spoken, uh, as a spoken and modernized language. So up until that time, it was used mainly for religious and biblical contexts, it was read rather than spoken. So try to imagine this, that a whole new set of words needs to be made up, actually. And a lot of Hebrew words were taken from different dialects and different languages, such as German, for instance, Arabic. So there is this need to come up with sounds that don't have Hebrew letters for, like z, ch, and here they are. Josef Kaplan added them. He also added a different set of vowel marks and treated them, instead of putting them below the letters like you see here on the bottom right, he decided to put them inside the line, just similar to Latin. He took this uh, further and 19 years later he presented a better set of this and showed how it can be applied in different, um, in different styles, but the context was now different. So if we're looking at the period, we must not forget that there is the context of the surrounding, the script that we're trying to design for, and the influences coming from within and outwards. The next one is a very radical anecdote in the history of the uh, Hebrew type design. This is Schoenfeld's type. So you Schoenfeld was a biblical British scholar, and he decided to fix the Hebrew. Uh, and these are not my words, these are his. Uh, the Hebrew in 1932, this is when he came up with this new system. Baseline, this is Hebrew. This is what he came up with, this is Hebrew. Uh, 
Okay? So he, uh, he wrote that the letters uh, are tortured, uh, they need to be fixed, they need to be, uh, become richer, um, and he actually added another set. He added a lowercase, completely made up, and the letters he designed, the, the basic letters, are actually cut and paste of bits and pieces of Latin letters, okay? So, uh, by the way, we're going to look into uh, legibility right now. So, he added them and he showed that they can be applied to many styles and they can be slanted if we want. They can get the Bodoni style, the Didon style. He also showed it next to the Latin and he presented it in a book he called The New Hebrew Typography as a homage, a tribute that we all know. I wanted to mark the letters that are illegible for Hebrew readers, just so you see the amount of them. I'm only the reporter. But if we're adding another layer to this and talking about the expertise, Stanley Morrison really um, promoted it and was in favor of this. And he wrote the introduction. So this added another layer of professional suggestions. Uh, but from uh, another perspective, there was this book, The Art of Hebrew Lettering, it's a great book, and in there they spoke about how rapidly Hebrew needed to be updated and adapted for modern use, and these are the illustrations they made actually showing what he thought of Schoenfeld's idea. So if we're looking at the legibility uh, factor, uh, and we always have this bar, the legibility of Schoenfeld's is way there. Another, uh, another example, talking about the expertise of the designer. Eric Gill, I assume everyone knows this guy. He was invited uh, in the 30s to, uh, to the land of Israel to, um, to do some inscriptions for the Rockefeller Museum. He uh, took inspiration from these inscriptions in Hebrew that he did. That he started, decided to do a, a typeface um, you know, using this inscriptional feel. What uh, Eric Gill did is mistakenly for, uh, used the Hebrew tags, the Hebrew instrokes. He mistakenly used them for Latin serifs. So basically he added Latin serifs on top of the Hebrew. This is a sketch from Monotype which decided, who decided to take this on as a typeface. Uh, later on it didn't proceed. However, it was published under the Jerusalem Time Type Foundry which is the first foundry in Israel was founded by Dr. Moshe Spitzer, a very well-known, very well-regarded typographer, book publisher, and entrepreneur, and so on, and he decided to publish this. He said he wrote in the, in the manual, in the specimen, he wrote that this is indeed unique, but it can be celebratory, and this is the path in the right direction. Uh, so we're having two experts doing something that was not done before, and now, you know, we're the ones to look at it. Uh, Ellie Gross, another designer, letter artist, she took inspiration from Eric Gill's work. So she was working on Hebrew typefaces, but she decided to go with that style as well. So now the, the topic and the story gets more complicated. The expertise is very high up in professional. The knowledge of Hebrew and the, the nature of Hebrew is very little. Basically what I want us all to come out of this is to be confused. <laughs> so another story this time talking about the expertise of the viewer, okay? So the users versus the designers and the context, the different platform. So this is how Hebrew looks in the same baseline typeface that I showed you in the last slide, in the last story. This is Frank Rule typeface. All the newspapers in Israel are printed with this sense forever, basically. And in 19... Uh, 87, there was a redesign for the daily newspaper Mariv, and they decided to go along with a version, this was not just because of technical reasons, a version of Narkis uh, linotype. And this was a typeface that is very well regarded in Israel. It is designed by a very expert type designer back then. Um, many of his typefaces are incredible and very useful. And the newspaper announced about this change. They had this piece in the front page that they're doing a redesign, a restructure of the newspaper, and they're going to be using a different typeface. Any thoughts on what happened? So less than two years later, they went back to the old Frank Rill. 
uh, the audience who are not type designers, they were complaining constantly. Not because the design doesn't look good in their eyes, but because of the credibility of the newspaper, it was harmed and affected to a state that they didn't trust the newspaper anymore. So just to say that the headlines did remain in the original typeface. They just changed the text typeface. Anyways, Mariv went back to the old Frank Rule typeface. So now we're looking at more of the amateur. The expertise is more of the amateur. And the context is different. All of a sudden, we're taking a typeface that is very well regarded, but we're putting it in a whole different context. And lastly, going into the digital age, we're going to look at the Samech. This is a one character in Hebrew. Important to say, in general, traditionally, the Hebrew letters are asymmetrical. There is no symmetric letters at all. So, Zvin Rikis, the guy from the last typeface, a very well-regarded typeface designer, he, de he designed two typefaces around the same time. It was 1979, and he wanted to differentiate the two of them. He treated these two typefaces as cousins, as he said, and you can see the letter that looks like an O, the round one, uh, is very much Latinized. What he did was eliminate the sharp corner from the top right, and made it a real circle. He never treated his typefaces as bilingual. He, his aim was not to make it you know, similar to the Latin. Um, but he did think that the Latin does have more richness to it. Uh, and you can see some of the sketches, and you can see how it looks. Later on, uh, we have Ariel typeface. The Hebrew version was designed by Baruch Gorkin, and he adapted this version of the round Samech. Today, it is very much used, uh, you know, online, digital, and to how our Hebrew eyes, we're so used to it, it doesn't even seem Latinized anymore. So, if we're in that form uh, um, area, we're heading into much more Latinized and a unique that actually becomes normal. So now we have even a movement in this bar. So, to end with, if we want to put some music on, imagine that there is music here. I invite all of us to think of these criteria or come up with any others the next time you're looking at type and giving your opinion. There are so many factors that are influencing them and in a different set of eyes, in a different time, in a different location, in a different context, our opinions might be different. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Liron. That was just fantastic. Um, just um, we've had some great comments online about how everyone is loving the lectures so far and how different everyone's thoughts and opinions are. It's just been really great. So um, I am next very happy to be handing over to David Williams, who is here in person as well. He's come all the way from Manchester again. It's just so great to have you here in person, David. So thank you, and over to you. Thank you very much, Becky. Thanks, Becky. It's an honour to be here talking today. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming along. Um, I thought it was a great opportunity to get myself a copy of this while I was down here from Oxfam. So, yeah, I wanted to s sort of approach this slightly differently because I'm at the beginning of my career as a type designer, um, and I don't really, don't really come from the same sort of position as a lot of the other people here who are more experienced. Um, but I have started teaching recently, and I get asked a lot about what kind of books I should re recommend to the students, and they ask me what makes a good typeface. Um, and so I thought, you know, is this book still valuable? It was written so long ago, um, sort of 65 years now, and does it have value um, for graphic design and typography students today? A lot of the students I meet, they're not necessarily going to go to Reading and do a master's in typeface design. They're not necessarily um, interested in the history of printing. So I wonder, sort of, is it the right kind of book to be recommending to them? Um, I think the majority of design students today probably haven't read this book, which is a bit of a shame. I think, um, I think it's appropriate to give to them because it helps me tell them stories about typography and type. Um, Beatrice Ward sort of deals with the physical considerations of type in the book. 
and um, she talks about setting type and set widths and although the students I talk to they've probably never heard of an Albion press they may never they may never see one they may never do letterpress printing um, I think that it's important for me to be able to talk to them about type and start from that historical standpoint so even though they don't know what a set width is I can sort of start talking about the amplifications of, uh, of the width of type and sort of from from the discussions of Fournier um, that Beatrice Ward is talking about um, Fournier and uh, it's Baskerville, the economies of the width. I could sort of talk to them about the the way that the way that the um, sorry, I'm just a little bit nervous here. <laughs> forgot to even go through my slides. I've got some more. <laughs> I've got, I don't do a lot of talking, so bear with me. But yeah, I've, you know, I've got all these old printing specimens and, you know, and I love to look at these, but I don't think the students are really looking at this kind of thing these days. Um, you know, there's lots of changed in type over the years. Um, let me just find where I'm at in my uh, things. Yeah, so... Yeah, so, so since, since the book was written, there's been a lot, lot of developments in type. You know, we've had sort of lenses and bulbs and lasers, and it's not all been good, as you can see. We end up with things like this. But if I talk to the students about the technology and how it's changed and the economies of printing, I can, I can start to talk to them about banks and miles and their telephone book type um, and how it saved loads of paper by having this economical width. I can go on and talk about Gulliver, uh, the late Harad Unger's typefaces that were designed specifically with these rectangular counters to withstand the brutality of um, newspaper printing. Um, and then I can go on to the present day, um, things like the Noto project has these you know, huge complex scripts um, like Myanmar, which, you know, you can go from 5 megabyte file down to 500 kilobytes. And when you're talking about um, loading speeds for a website, you know, that's really important. Designers don't really want to have too many fonts on the site because they're going to get deranked by Google. So by talking about Beatrice Ward and starting off talking about something like set width, I can transition with the students into talking about contemporary technology and contemporary type in a way that seems more relevant to them. So one of the other questions I had from rereading this essay, um, Beatrice Ward, she talks about harmonization in type. And at the time in the 1930s, you know, it was very different. She talks about the Roman and an Italic and a Greek and harmonizing those together. Well, now, you know, we have typefaces that are so much bigger um, so much larger in scope. We've gone from things like Cheltenham, which Paul identified before, um, which did have about 20 styles in this 1923 specimen book that I've got. You know, and then we get to the 1950s, you've got Univer, um, Phototype comes along, and the reproduction of masters is a lot easier, um, and it sort of slows the, uh, it speeds up the reproduction time. And then things expand even more. You get things like Lucas Tegruz Greta, and you start to get much more multi-script typography, um, things like Mukta. And, um, and so the typefaces keep expanding and keep expanding. And so that also made me question, is it relevant what Beatrice Ward has to say? But I think it is, because I think it helps me build that narrative. It helps me talk about different epochs in type design, different technology and the limitations that have allowed these expanded typefaces now, but it seems to me that the constraints on type have always been the same. But just to produce like a light motive, um, sort of a thread throughout history for these students who don't have an awareness of the things that we might have, it, it's more likely to inspire them and engage them and maybe you know, allow them to speculate a little and imagine themselves um, in a contemporary setting. And it's, you know, harmonization is a really big part of type now. It's rewarded at Grandjean. It's a big part of the MATD at Reading. You know, you're encouraged to do multi-script type. Um, 
and again, it it just um, it helps me talk to the students. Um, another thing that I noticed was that the constraints that Beatrice Ward talks about, um, these things don't seem to have changed. They don't seem to have gone away. You know, we have the same forces acting upon us as type designers that were present when the when Beatrice wrote the Crystal Goblet. The constraints of readability. You know, as she says, type has to be sort of harmonious, a contiguous design. It has to um, not have letters that stand out too much, and it has to leave you with um, an encouraging experience, a comfortable experience when you're reading it. And this has always been present, and it's present today. And you see that in the kind of um, typefaces that are most popularly used for long form reading or in newspapers. We seem to go back to these classical models. And so I think it's good for students to learn about this so they don't get too carried away picking really crazy fonts to go and try and set their dissertations in. And believe me, I've seen some pretty messy fonts. Um, another one, accuracy. You know, it has to be able to, typography has to be able to accurately reproduce the narratives and the discourse of human beings. And the more complicated our society gets, the more complex the typefaces uh, become. And so again, it's a constraint that's always been there, and it keeps pushing typography and typeface design into new places, and I think that will always continue. And accessibility, um, accessibility for users of type, again, a constraint that's always there, something that's always pushing typeface development along, um, and something that I think it's important for young students to consider as well, and something that is touched upon by Beatrice Ward in On the Choice of Typeface. So basically what I'm trying to say is students, they need to grasp the problems that surround typography and typeface design. You know, they need to, um, they need to know the reasons why when I went and bought this record, I flip it over on the back, and all the Arabic letters are disconnected into isolated forms. This is still happening today. And so students need to be pushed into the minutiae of typeface design and the complexity of typography and how many different interconnected systems there are in the field now. You know, you've got the designer with their software, you've got the font engineer with their software coming after that. Then you've got the app and the device developer sort of embedding fonts and their software and their platforms. Then you might have the publisher the blogger on top of that, doing layouts, again, um, interfacing with typography. And then after that, you've got end users, you know, stretching and skewing and copying and pasting. And, you know, we want students to be able to understand why, when they write 80,000 words of a manuscript in Google Sheets and they copy and paste it into InDesign, all the quotation marks just disappear. And I believe that's a true story. So. Even now, we still have these problems. As you can see, you know, you hit the um, Arabic button on the World Health Organization website and you end up with, I don't know, leading of about 400%. I'm not sure why this is still happening today. There are lots of typefaces out there. But I keep coming across graphic designers who don't have this sort of close knowledge of typography. And I think this is a perfect example of it. And so, I think the Crystal Goblet does contain lots of valuable information, and I think it does maintain its pedagogical value, and I will definitely continue to recommend it to students that are silly enough to come and ask me to talk to them about type. And uh, that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, David. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, and now we are going to another video. Um, and Ellen is on Zoom. So welcome, Ellen. Um, she's joining us from Baltimore this evening in the US. Um, and we're delighted that she could be part of tonight as well. And so over to something very different. So thank you, Ellen. I'm Ellen Lupton. I'm a writer and a designer. When I went to Cooper Union School of Art in the early 1980s, it was hard to become a graphic designer. You had to be very neat and precise and work with these physical tools. Many of these tools are obsolete today or even illegal. 
I was terrible at using these tools, but I fell in love with graphic design anyway. Why? Because typography. Typography is concrete language. Typography is a writing tool. I met my life partner, Abbott Miller, at Cooper Union. We loved Swiss modernism and the Bauhaus, but we were skeptical too. At the time, Jenny Holzer was posting cheaply printed manifestos on the streets in the East Village. Work like hers didn't fit into definitions of design as problem solving. At the time, we were reading books about power and knowledge and about writing as an instrument of power. We wanted to explore how language is stored, shared, made public, made secret, made accessible, made inaccessible. Typography was our tool for doing that. For centuries, people have used typography to unlock the power of writing or to lock it back up. So let's talk about the F word. No, no, nope, not font. I'm not going to talk about fonts. I'm going to talk about feminism. When I was working on my book, Design is Storytelling, in 2017, I asked Ruben Pater if he would write a blurb for me. And what he wrote surprised me. Ruben said that my book was written from a female point of view. This comment made me step back and ask, wow, is this book feminist? Does it have a female perspective? And I thought, well, maybe, yeah. This diagram of the user experience as a popsicle, maybe that is kind of feminist. Or this translation of Maslow's hierarchy of user needs as an ice cream cake. Maybe that's kind of feminist too. Feminism, however, isn't just soft and squishy and sweet. Feminism is badass. There's a history of thinking about vision in terms of violence and power. Vision creates subjects and objects. Vision is an active process of focus and searching. Who has that power and who doesn't? The Greek god Medusa had snakes for hair. She was so ugly that when men looked at her, they turned into stone. Medusa reversed the power dynamic of the male gaze. In 2021, I published Extra Bold with seven co-authors. Extra Bold explores the power dynamics of history, theory, and work for graphic designers. This diagram of intersectionality by Jennifer Tobias explores the collision of sexism, racism, and ableism. The story begins with a guy called Mythical Norm. This guy is based on a famous essay by Audre Lorde, who writes about how our society creates an invented normative character, a type. We may think we're designing for mythical norm or that all the best designers look like him, but mythical norm doesn't really exist. Most people fail to match his features. Graphic designers are in the norm business from consistency, hierarchy, and Helvetica to the UI, UX industrial complex. The process of becoming a designer means learning to create and enforce these norms. Graphic design can also enforce binaries. Human beings want to sort the world into yes or no boxes, especially in modern industrial culture because that's very efficient. But most phenomena sit on a spectrum where soft, squishy gradients may work better than hard opposites. 
Latin typography loves binaries. We have come to accept these binaries as fundamental to what typography is. These patterns, however, emerged over time in Latin-based cultures. Beatrice Ward praises the freedom of those less binary times when she writes, quote, when italic was thought of as a separate cursive, a certain latitude and individuality was allowed to it. This diagram by John Barry asks, what is a serif? Some letter forms don't quite conform to the binary. As typography goes forward, Many people are designing characters whose bodies don't fit into neat categories. Glyph World, a typeface by Leah Maldonado asks, what is a family? The normative definition of a family is a mommy, daddy, and two kids. Yet many of us live alone or with our grandparents, step parents, or pets. Here are some stories from Extra Bold History. These stories ask the question, who had access to the tools of publishing? Let's take a trip to 16th century Paris, the center of the global printing industry. High tech business. Print required capital, employees, a network for distributing books, knowledge of legal issues, and knowledge of content. In 16th century Paris, women published 1,250 book titles. We know this because of the research by historian Beatrice Hubbard Beach, who sifted through the known books of Paris to find out who printed them. Let's compare Paris to London, where only 85 books were published by women. Now, just what was it about French women that got them into the publishing industry? Was it because they don't finish all their chocolate cake? Was that their secret to success? Well, no, actually. Here's how you could become a woman publisher in Paris. One, you had to be the daughter of a printer. Two, you had to marry a printer. Three, you had to have babies. And four, your husband had to be dead. Babies, you ask, why babies? What do babies have to do with printing? Well, if you birthed some babies, then you could legally inherit your husband's property. Women who were widowed without children could not inherit property. They were on their own. Think about that. One of these printers was Yolanda Bonhomme, who distributed books across Western Europe. She employed 25 workers and contracted work out to other printers in Paris. We know this book was her because she put her name on the title page. Now let's take a trip to the American colonies in the 1700s where widows with children could also inherit their husband's businesses. This story starts with Benjamin Franklin, a famous American politician and inventor. As a teenager, Ben learned to print from his brother James. James married Anne Smith. Anne and James had babies, and James died. And thus, Anne Smith became a printer, known as the Widow Franklin. She printed legal documents, novels, her own newspaper, and local gossip, which was very popular. This drawing shows Anne Franklin with her daughters, who were typesetters. It is known that Anne Franklin owned a slave who worked in the print shop alongside her family. Enslaved people in urban areas were often hired out to printing companies. James Wells Brown worked in a print shop in St. Louis, Missouri where he was enslaved. He later became a free man and a prominent abolitionist, feminist, novelist, and historian. While learning to print, Brown also learned to read and write. Typography was his gateway to literacy. Like many abolitionists, Brown gave numerous public lectures and sold his books at these events. 
Brown had casts made of the printing forms of his autobiography so that he could continue to publish his book independently. He carried these plates with him on his travels. Thus Brown owned his own stereotypes. The word stereotype comes from printing. Typographers and type designers have always written their own history. The more inclusive histories we are writing today are opening up the field to more people. I'm gonna end with this quote by Shira Inbar from Extra Bold. One of typography's foundational texts is the Crystal Goblet by Beatrice Ward. I find it interesting that a woman advocated for invisibility in design. Perhaps she was feeling invisible herself. Thank you. Oh, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, it's on. Um, thank you so much, Ellen, for another fantastically brilliant talk. Um, I'm just loving how diverse and how thought-provoking everyone's talks are tonight. And finally, we have um, our last speaker joining us from overseas again, um, Eric van Blockland, who's from the Netherlands, and I know he's on Zoom. So hi, Eric. It's lovely to see you virtually. Um, so I am now going to hand over to Eric. So thank you. Hello, um, I'm recording this and I think uh, this was supposed to be the last talk, but who knows what happened. And, uh, but I'm guessing all the good things have been said already and you're already at the uh, Crystal Goblet Bar. But um, my name is Eric from Lockland. Um, I draw uh, letters uh, for myself and companies and other designers and screens and books. And I, I spend some time uh, thinking about ways of making uh, type. And then insufferably, I also uh, teach uh, making uh, letters. Um, I've cornered the market of uh, hand-drawn 16-page uh, fish magazines and um, I also drew the letters for the St. Uh, Bride tote bag, uh, which makes me very happy. Anyway, to business. Uh, there, are good, uh, there are bad types and good types and the whole science of art and topography begins after the first category has been set aside. I struggle with this statement probably more than necessary until Paul Barnes thankfully sent me the article. It came in for context. Uh, and that was very interesting. So I set out to explore these ideas around Ward's good, uh, bad type thing because uh, this might also shed a light on uh, the criteria for type. And maybe there's something to learn uh, whether we are using, uh, drawing, discussing or teaching it. The text, which I'm sure you've all read, uh, Ward mentions a secret society of oculists uh, which I imagine we could call upon in a dark hour of typographic need, dispensing swift typographic justice and assistance. Of course, it turns out it's just an old word for eye doctor, and it wasn't a secret after all, but by then I had already drawn its secret badge. So I'll keep those around for now. But still, her statement is pretty strong. Ward even calls upon science and art of typography to weigh in, and she's not going to be misunderstood. Oh man, to be so cranky, to be so sure. But in earnest, in the text, I think she is addressing an audience of book topographers. Strategies on how to make the best selection for whatever is available at a printer. And each of these typefaces will have characteristics that may or may not benefit the book. The question is, why did you choose this font? When you are choosing fonts, you look for broad categories of attributes. Maybe imagine uh, observing cattle in a field because at a distance the attributes of the collective are more visible than details of the individual. And we can make up our mind whether a Frisian or a Hereford would be most appropriate. And so a topographer might assign broad attributes to whole typefaces to help find the most appropriate one for a book. This one is wider. This one is in the possession of an italic. This one is suitable for those continental languages. Uh, that sort of thing. The point is, the attributes are fixed and immutable. The bullet points in the specimen book. Ward wrote, Baskerville, being relatively generous and set with, will drive out the book, whilst Fournier, a neatly condensed face, will be more frugal of space. Oh yeah, I drew a Fournier for this presentation. But 
suppose we look from the perspective of making type, then things are different because we need to analyze type in greater detail and we have to make decisions, many decisions. And I think we need the whole art and science of topography to, to determine much more than just good or bad. For a type designer, those attributes are not immutable. It's not just Baskerville will or Fournier won't, but rather we start by framing questions like how wide does this typeface need to be? Or maybe where will the reader be relative to this text? And then the logical follow-up, what are good ways to draw visual solutions to explore these questions? And, and maybe even reflect on how well is the current drawing succeeding in addressing our goals, etc. And this limousin illustrates the point. We can have control over the attributes. We can make a thing that fits our wishes. Uh, but what do we wish for? Note I'm already regretting the cattle metaphors, they're stomping all over the place and already we have stretching cows and designers with knives and what can I say? Type is this weird discipline that invites all these comparisons to other creative things like music or food or whatever and then two sentences into the argument you will find the whole thing comes tumbling down. Always. But that's a different talk. In retrospect, metaphorical fish might have been more useful than metaphorical cattle certainly more fun to draw. And so here's a Beatrice Ward Memorial Lecture first, uh, a slide of fish. Anyway, despite millions of years of evolution, once a 10-point Fournier is projected on our retina, from here to there, it is not much more than a homeopathic Fournier smear that will barely make a photoreceptor pop. Regardless, the rest of your brain will be happy to volunteer which letter this might have been and even offer words that these, these letters might be participating in and uh, all this perpetuating the illusion that we know what we're doing. Uh, this is the miracle of reading. So anything we can learn from the oculist? The process of reading is so delicate and so biologically challenging that we need to call upon our oculist to operate their machines and whisper a prayer to Zernike. But this is also why we have to spend uh, so much time getting the type and the topography right. Because information is lost in this soupy projection. We have to put in so much more to even be, to be left with, with a, a, a minute amount of information. But it also means that theoretically there's an infinite number of different originals that will get the same fuzzy result on the retina. And so, type for reading is governed by the rough attributes that actually survive the disgusting eye. Spacing, proportion, weight. It is so tempting to dive into the clever details of these shapes, and our modern tools offer an accuracy that John and Pierre Simon could not imagine. But if something is off in the spacing, or the proportions do not make sense, it doesn't matter how accurate the curves on the stems were, or how scientific your measurings of weight, because it will not have made a difference. So this means we can draw new things that would read very comfortably but still differ enough from historical models to keep it fresh and interesting. We could, when nobody's looking, even draw things that are slightly less familiar. We might climb over that wall of John and Pierre Simon's carefully tended garden. We might not always understand what we're looking for and the criteria of judging the things we encounter might fall short. Or we might have to learn to understand what we see. And it's some risk. The garden wall kept us safe. And this new project might not work out, but then again it just might. We could discover new shapes and new perspectives, <clears throat> new ways of working, and I'm in favor of such explorations. I love and respect the rich history that our discipline belongs to, but I think I'm on the side of the experimentalist. As designers, we moved away from what would Beatrice choose we're not just selecting options from a menu and then assembling the parts. We're building massive trees of decisions and ideas and internal dependencies in which each step has consequences. And that means you can hire a type designer to fix that logo. Uh, you can get someone who understands letters to do that lettering and maybe just draw the title for that cover rather than use a font. And at the end, at the very least, you can license some fonts to, that do not look like anything else. And by using and commissioning new work, you support designers and studios that live and work today. And perhaps that sounds a bit lame, but these women and men will answer the phone. 
and the type they draw will be the result of a dialogue between you and them and it will include all the attributes they can think of. This will definitely make you feel better. I think the discipline of making type is more open and accessible than it was in Beatrice's days. It's getting better. We have great tools, supportive communities, online libraries, archives, workshops, mentors, friends, teachers, courses and schools. I'm not sure it has become any less difficult to make type though. And no matter how you go about this, it is still a very complex task. It takes time to figure all this out and do well. The important thing is that these challenges are open to many more people with many more perspectives and experiences because that means much more and much better work will be done. And I'm sure that even Beatrice would approve of that. A big thanks uh, to St. Bright for this invitation. I hope you enjoyed this presentation, if, if anything, for its brevity. Um, I miss London and St. Bright and I wish I could be there with you. So cheers and all the best from The Hague and thank you for your attention. Um, I would just like to say a huge thank you again to all our speakers. You have all been brilliant. And if you don't know, they give their time freely. And I know how long it can take to write a 10-minute talk, sometimes longer than a 60-minute talk, if you believe it. So huge thanks to David, to Ellen, to Liron, to Martina, Eric, um, Paul, and I'm sure I've forgotten Liron as well. So thank you all so much. It's been absolutely fantastic. Thank you all for coming. Huge thanks again to David Pearson. And thanks to Sophie Liene, the St. Bride's team, and Andrew for filming and making sure the live stream has gone perfectly. I think a few people are probably going to the Old Bell, as is tradition. So thank you all again. Have a fantastic evening. And goodbye to everyone on Zoom and in person. Thank you so much. <laughs>